<clears throat> for quite some time we've been talking about kingdom of God and I do have every intent to continue the study but uh, tonight we'll switch gears and talk about something else and this is why um, probably some or all of you know what's going to happen on 31st of this month right October 31st uh, I see Luba's hand like, I know, well, this is what's going to happen. It's not Halloween. No, it's not. But October uh, 31st of this year will hit 500-year mark since Reformation has begun. Uh, since uh, Martin Luther nailed his thesis to the door of the chapel, and uh, from that point and on, so many things happen. And because we people oftentimes live in our generation and uh, not trying to encompass everything that happened, we think, well, it affected us in some way, but in reality, it affected humanity, you know, without exaggerating big time. It affected the world big time, it actually affected uh, this country and its beginning in major way, you know, so many things happened since then and uh, uh, it, Since we have Four weeks. I'm not sure at this point whether it'll be Wednesdays only but I'd like to talk about stuff uh, that pertaining to uh, Reformation uh, my approach is this I want to talk about pros and cons of Reformation because I want to give fair evaluation in my opinion, uh, of course, subjective opinion of what took place since, because there were some great things that came with it and some stuff that is not that great. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about great stuff. So relax. We're going to talk about good things that came with Reformation next Wednesday, though. Bring your patience with me because we'll be dealing with some stuff that we're not that proud of. Of course, we won't be calling you back into Catholicism, you know, but at the same time, we need to um, um, basically agree. Maybe it's time to reform the Reformation. Maybe it's time for, you know, another reformer arise and lead the whole thing because we're not where we need to be. Lots of good things happen again, but uh, some of the negative stuff happen. We'll talk about negativity next Wednesday. Maybe I shouldn't say it because attendance will be next to nothing, right? Uh, it'll be great, guys. Come next Wednesday. Uh, but uh, today I'd like to talk about five things. I know there's much more than five things things that came out of Reformation, but five things I'm appreciative of, five things I'm grateful for. And uh, these five are following. They'll come out of my mouth as statements, but after each statement, there's a thought or doctrine, and we will get to it later. But this is what came with Reformation. By faith alone. It was coined by Reformation because prior to it, you had to do certain works, uh, penance, whatever the word is. You have to buy your loved ones out of purgatory, things like this. With Reformation, it was changed. Faith alone saves us. By faith alone, one can be justified. Okay? Now, next thing... Um, by Wardell, on the fancy terms is sola fide, sola scriptura. This is Latin for you, you know. I just don't want to sound too confusing, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, plain English is this. By scripture alone, which means word of God does have final authority and preside over anything else in our life. There's lots of valid sources for the knowledge of truth, such as, you know, tradition, uh, creation, uh, conscience, experiences. But Word of God preside over all this. Uh, and uh, 
we need to understand this is something that came with with reformation uh you know grace alone we will talk about this as well because um uh the i guess the work of salvation is not based on any merit of man it, it comes before faith you know before and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago we talked about goodness of god you know it is goodness of god that leads us to repentance so before we even believe before we even repent it all starts with god goodness he loved us when we were unlovable so uh, again uh, this came with reformation and then by christ alone you know because um, uh, there is uh, again for us it may be but what else of course it's not by lee or genia but if you will uh, sneak peek into russian orthodox greek orthodox or catholic church you'll find out they pray to all sorts of saints, you know, um, relics, icons, you know, Saint Anne, Saint Peter's. They have saints for everything. Uh, Vera, uh, Nadia, and I went to Russia, and we went by a beautiful uh, temple that they built uh, called the Temple of the Birth of Christ. And next to it, a monument. And since lots of miners in this region, and actually this very building was built because somewhere in this area, uh, up to 90 miners died in one of the mines. And, you know, they kind of built it as memorial. And they put a statue. And I don't remember what was her name, but basically she's protector of the miners, which means if you, uh, I think so, uh, it's um, yeah, I, uh, it's like you have to pray to this particular, if your husband is a minor or if your son is a minor, you don't go to Jesus, you go to this Barbara, you know, and you pray to her because it's her realm. She's protecting minors, supposedly. And there's lots of it in Catholic and Orthodox Church, and we need to understand by Christ alone. For you, like right now, it's like a no-brainer. But it was very revolutionary back in the day. And again, glory to God alone. The final, the fifth one. The last two came kind of later, but first three. And we will just uh, have general, uh, you know, review of these things tonight. Uh, but maybe down the road we'll uh, look at each one of these um, truths uh, separately. So the final one, uh, glory to God alone. Again, nobody else receives the glory. There was no mediator between God and men but Jesus Christ. You know, you don't have to go to a priest and get through him. I mean, we have uh, Jesus appointed for some to be pastors, to be apostles, to guide people but to guide them into this very reality. Like, you need to have personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We appeal to each other's wisdom, but there is no mediator but Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's there. Again, no other saint, you know, no angel. And uh, final glory, uh, go to God alone. It's not like, well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thomas, thank you, whoever, who knows what, you know, Barbara. No, glory goes to God alone. So it's kind of brief um, um, scope of things that I would like to talk about. Uh, again, there was more to be grateful for. More of the good things came out of Reformation, but uh, uh, time will not permit to go through all of it. But again, be ready. Because sometimes soon I'll unload lots of negative stuff came with it. And we need to deal with it. We need to deal with it. I'm not going to be talking about this stuff today, though. So, however, before we'll get into um, certain passages and all those things that I uh, mentioned in the opening, I'd like to start with a little biography on Reformer himself. And I cannot guarantee it's accurate. I think most of it will be accurate, but 
I had no time to rehearse, uh, read it again, you know. Um, I will encourage every one of you to study the life of this man. But um, uh, Martin Luther uh, was a German monk. Before he became a monk, though, he was studying uh, to be an attorney. He studied the law. Actually, let me go even further, because he was born into family of a miner, talking about miners. You know, his father was a miner, but not just an average guy. He had some sort of business, you know, mining business. And since mining was very difficult thing to do, he was hoping for better future for his son. Uh, and um, uh, he sent his son to... He gave him pretty good uh, education. The young fellow was pretty bright. So he sent him to school, but all with an intent that he would, you know, get a degree in the law. Uh, so uh, the story goes this way, that one day on the way to university, he walked through a field and he was caught into some terrible thunderstorm. Uh, you know, one of those when... It's very seldom we see it here, actually. You know, in other parts of the world, even though it does happen here, but some places. Uh, I remember leaving Ohio on the airplane. And as we're taking off, uh, lightning bolts going not just vertically, but horizontally as well. And they're all over the place. And I'm like, Lord, get me out of here quickly. You know, what have I done? What did went wrong? You know, but uh, I kind of understand what Martin Luther felt at the time when uh, lightning bolts were landing nearby him. So he was all terrified and he actually prayed to one of the saints and uh, give a promise if he will survive this, he will become a monk. So uh, the storm quieted down <laughs> miraculously. <laughs> Dude was not killed, so he decided to follow up on his word. And of course, uh, his parents, they were disappointed. You know, They wanted him to become an attorney. They poured some money into it, but he basically followed, in some belief, uh, or, you know, he probably meditated on this anyhow because it can't happen just like this. But we can't speculate in this area. Nevertheless, he became a monk, but with huge sense of, like, guilt. You know, like, I'm never good enough for God. What else I can do for him to receive me? And we need to understand back in that day, there is no, none of the doctrines that we're talking about right now. Um, actually, the situation is this. Like right now, I see almost everyone does have phone or Bible on the lap. Back in that day, you can't have it. Even if you do have it, it's in Latin. And even if you do have it in Latin, you're not permitted to read and to interpret because of all previous heresies, church has made decision out of good intention, like since so many Heresy is coming out of it. Let us take it out of the hands of the common men. And only clergy, those who are trained, will be interpreting it to people. But in the course of time, guess what? Whatever priests want you to believe, you believe. You have no ways to check it. And they come up with some weird doctrines, you know, with very weird unbiblical doctrines. So he's a monk. He's with this... Uh, unhealthy drive he's going to confession every day he's driving priests crazy because over every every thought and every little thing he want to confess and finally one of the priests suggests look you know you don't really know God the way you should you need to go and study you, know, you need to go and read the word and study who God truly is and he's doing it he went and he started to read the Bible and things happen when you start to read the Bible. Start to read. He started to read the Bible and he started to discover things, you know, like, wow, you know, what we believe and what I see is two different things. And everybody pretending to be normal. So it's either them not reading it or reading something different. So imagine what kind of stuff going through his head. Actually, when I start to read the Bible, I had to check some inherited beliefs also. 
You know, for example, in Russian Pentecostal church, belief was maintained unless you're speaking in tongues, you're not saved. You need to speak in tongues to be saved. When I start to read the Bible, wait a minute, this is not biblical. This is just one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. It's fun thing to do. It's gift of God, you know, but again, this is not something that saves you. And there was many other things that I had to let go, dismiss. There was lots of good healthy stuff, but this is why we have this privilege. You know, if you do have Bible, read it. If you don't have it, get it and read it. This is, this is awesome. This is huge. People died for the very fact to have, you know, copy. I even... In my parents' generation, copy was hard to obtain. So read your Bible. So this guy, he's reading Bible now. He's really into it. And he's finding a lot of things that contradict the current way of things. And uh, he's writing uh, 95 theses and nailing them to the door of the chapel in the city of Wittenberg, I believe. Um, I, you know, there could be different way to pronounce it, but I think that's the city, you know. He nailed them to the door of the chapel. Very, it's not very big chapel, but since you need to understand, like in this time, church everywhere in our civilized world is one church. There are some Greek Orthodox far, far away, some Russian Orthodox far, far away, but everywhere, like for people who don't travel, don't have internet, radio, TV, all that they know is Catholic Church. You can't go to Methodist or Lutheran or Pentecostal because you go to next church and they also Catholic and they answer to one authority. So if you do thing in one church, it goes all over the place. So he nailed this thesis and he wanted to debate these issues that he, he's not agreeing with. And uh, his first, his first intent, of course, not just, well, I'm going to start a new movement. I'm going to split the church. No, he's sincere. He, he wants to, like, challenge somebody, like, look, if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. But if I'm right, why do we practice all this stuff? You know, and uh, he nailed it there. But instead of, like, okay, let's talk about it. Let's debate. Let's have dialogue. It was, who do you think you are? you changing, challenging beliefs of the mother church that was around for 1,500 years, you know? you challenging the authority of Pope, who is the voice of God on earth. Who do you think you are? Like, who do you, to challenge all these beliefs we have? And he was denied this dialogue. Uh, you know, I think if they would know what it will result in they probably would talk to the fellow because even now they recognize martin luther as a push within the catholic church toward reviewing some of this stuff you know he was a catalyst for certain things to happen in catholic church as well but at this time he wanted to debate and they just denying him and and they basically telling him shush you know, I, I think just like in most conflicts of men, you know, like, you let, let's talk. No, shut up. Who do you think you are? You know, we're not talking. And uh, he made one attempt, another attempt. Nobody want to talk to him. But meanwhile, he's getting audience. Meanwhile, he's getting listeners. He's talking to them. Look, guys, this is what I actually written. He's writing essays and stuff like this. So you basically can't hide this problem anymore. And now Pope declaring him as wild boar who's ruining, uh, you know, garden, Lord's guard or something, you know, and excommunicating him from the church. But this guy already gained the momentum. He does have quite a bit of followers in his region. So they're trying to lure him out of the region, you know, that's supposedly he had to go to Rome somewhere to give an account for what he believes. But um, I suppose he had some friends in high places. So somebody who was looking after him rearranged it and made it so it would be somewhere locally. The whole like listening to his case. 
So when he showed up, um, again, he uh, was expecting that at this time they will discuss scripture with him. You know, but um, when he showed up, all these noble people, magistrates and priests and, you know, fancy dresses, gold, all this kind of stuff, you know, and he shows up to talk to them and they're like, we can't, you know, uh, or else. And he's cornered, like, what do I do? Because he believed this to be true, and this high official is telling him, we can't. So he's asking for 24 hours. He said, give me 24 hours to think about this. They give him 24 hours thinking, you know, guy is scared. He'll come back. We can't. Problem is solved. We're going to burn his books and, you know, no more. He comes back, and I cannot say it word for word, but he basically says, unless you prove me from the scripture that I am wrong, my conscience do not allow me to recant. So I think right there, this guy in his mind already presenting sola scriptura by scripture alone. Like, if you want to prove me wrong, prove me wrong, but by not the words of pope or magistrate, but show me in the scripture where I do error, then I will. But until then, I will not recant. Of course, everybody is angry. Like, oh, they want to, you know, they want to, and they basically declare him outlaw, which means anybody could kill him and nothing you know, it's like like killing an animal. He's not citizen. He's an outlaw. He's, you know, and so uh, his life is in jeopardy because there's lots of haters. There's some supporters. So some kind of high rank prince snatching him and placing him into one of his castles where for next, you know, years or months he's working on translating New Testament from Latin to German. You see, uh, this guy, you know, was some sort of Apostle Paul in his day and time. Because remember how Apostle Paul challenged all existing system and starts to preach grace, you know, and he actually started to speak against those who upheld the law. But now, in the course of time, all of the work of Apostle Paul is hidden. Church is corrupt. I'm sure there are sincere people here or there. And this guy's starting all over again, but against this huge, I'm hesitant to say monster, right? I don't want to badmouth, you know, uh, but in a sense, it's just, it just huge, you know, and he's coming against it all by himself. We need to know there was some before him. They have not succeeded, though. Uh, I also know um, uh, evangelical movements or Protestant movements, uh, uh, like over in Russia, uh, we had movements of our own, but they were all suppressed. Uh, even uh, Protestants of Russia, over evangelicals of Russia and Ukraine, the, the, the movement came from, from the West to us. Because um, yeah, I've read some of the history, you know, everyone or everything that ever, you know, tried because in Russia they were so want to unify around one religion that everything will be suppressed harshly. But same thing was in Roman Empire. You know, same thing. You know, they want to suppress it, but at this time it's like little too late. He's having too many supporters, and this guy getting bolder and bolder. And finally he's saying things like, the word of Pope... Is not the word of, you know, how they uphold this doctrine, you know, that the word of Pope is infallible, you know, and this guy challenging it like, man, you speaking about, and uh, again, back in that day, Pope does have not just some sort of religious power to send somebody to hell, but also political power. You know, nobody talked about separation between church and state back then. So they can reach you, they can get you, and this guy just goes. You know, after all this stuff. 
See, this is what we need to um, yeah, understand. Uh, the conflict, the conflict that we need to come to grips with. I, I have to go like back into history again, all the way to the Garden of Eden, guys. Okay, uh, we spend a lot of time there lately. Let's go there once again. So let me ask you, what was the source for knowing God for Adam and Eve? What was the source? God himself, personal relationship, right? There was no Torah, nothing written. So the ultimate source or primary source for knowing God was relationship with God. But then they commit sin. They're kicked out of the garden. You know, and now they have children. And it seems like their children also have relationship with God. They sacrifice to God. But at the same time, they have parents to tell them story. This is how it all happened. So all of a sudden, there was two sources. Tradition, passing down some of the experiences and personal experience. Not everybody was per privileged to get personal experience. Not everybody in the history of mankind, you know, had this privilege to speak to God as Enoch did, for example, or Noah. You know, but there was tradition. The truth was passed down from generation to generation, from mouth to mouth. But then when it comes to Moses and Moses goes to the top of the mountain and God giving to him ten commandments and written scripture, guess what happened? God himself switching authority from personal experience or tradition to written word. Are you following me? To degree that he said, even if prophet, and you can find this in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, I believe. If there will be a prophet or dreamer of dreams who will rise among you, and he will perform sign or wonder and say, let us go and serve some other gods or let us do this, let us do that, which I have not commanded, you know, let him be stoned. So all of a sudden, you know, God himself saying right now, all the signs, wonders, prophecies, you know, if they do not match with the written word, kill the guy. So things do change right now. And for years, the source for knowing God, Torah. You know, they have to compare everything that they see, like whether, okay, uh, you know, whether it's aligning with what they have. But this Torah or Tanakh, whatever they had in the day, also said, well, actually, Torah, Torah, Mo Moses himself said that God will raise a prophet like me. To him you should listen, pointing to Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes to the sin, and uh, uh, he does have followers who recognize him as Messiah, then he's becoming ultimate source for truth. No, the written word is still of value, but it speaks of him, and it says when he arrives, you listen to him. And he's saying lots of new things. You know, but nevertheless, disciples are bound by the fact he is Messiah. We're going to listen to him, but then Jesus leaves, and what do we do? Well, for a while, there's disciples to pass down his teaching, but then they start to write. You know, epistles and gospels and things like this. And this epistles traveling as written letters here and there. Churches actually, and you can find this in the New Testament. Paul saying, after you read it, give it to this church so they can read it. So they're exchanging this, making copies of these letters. They're reading it, you know, and it's gaining authority of the word of God. And then some heretics start to, you know, come up with Paul's canon. And church had to respond. They're like, look, we need to do something about this. Jesus is gone, so is apostles. We all have holy scriptures. We do refer to them as to the word of God. It was eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They saw him. They've heard him. Let us come together and recognize the canon. This is what we need to understand. Church did not determine which book will or not be. They basically recognized what to canonize. 
And after they did, you know, ideally, after you recognize something as a word of God, you respond to it to be like, but now let's submit to it. But instead it was, look, we are the church. If we had to define what the word of God is, then church does have final authority. Are you following me? Because for next 1,500 years, they think final authority is us. And I'm sure there was people challenging it, but their thinking was this. Well, who put the Bible together? We did. So who is the final authority? Us, church, Pope. You know, uh, but Martin Luther was like, no. The Word of God does have final authority. See, we need to appreciate this because even now, when you look and you're like, man, what's going on in this church or in that church? And you don't understand the root of the problem in these churches that are ordaining perverts right now is the fact they're not upholding the Word of God like you and I do. They think that they as a church can come and decide, man, this is outdated. This is, you know, we outgrew this the uh, civilization moving on, so shall we, you know, and they, they don't have the same respect. So we need to be appreciative of the fact that someone long time ago said, look, guys, you are wrong. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. And like, well, show us in the Bible, where do you find by Scripture alone? Well, actually, there is verses, we're going to look at some. You know, but his argument was, you call it Word of God, right? You call it Word of God, submit to it, because this is God's Word. You know, sometimes I hear uh, my friend Jerry saying that Scripture should be interpreted by the Scripture, right? You know, it's part of the concept uh, solace of sola scriptura, that if you don't understand something, you have to find the answer within the Scripture. You don't pull some additional, but C.S. Lewis said this and this. Well, I appreciate what he said, but when it comes to the Scripture, Scripture must be interpreted by the Scripture. See, by Scripture alone, by the Word of God alone. And now this thing's coming, and they're fresh, and they knew. And Bible printed in German and French and English, and people reading their Bible and they discovering, man, no, the f Word of God does have final authority. Well, guess what? Unless we keep it this way, we will be in the heap of a trouble. As soon as we remove this and we're like, no, church is final authority, or it's all relative, there was no absolutes. We're going to be in so much of trouble. Because once you erase the boundaries of Lord, which is word of God, you know, then why your opinion should preside over my opinion? We have to be diligent and go back to the word of God. Let me go to um, several passages within the Bible that testify about this collection of books, that this is inspired word of God. It does have this authority over all other sources. So, uh, of course, Second Peter is well known. One, Second Peter one twenty and twenty one. Second Peter chapter one verse twenty through twenty one. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, which means Scriptures, because he viewed all Scriptures as prophetic word. Not just prophetic books, but all of the Scriptures. So, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if... This is inspired by the Spirit. Does it have authority over us or we have authority over it? I think it does have authority over us. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But with this too, one can come and debate and say, look, when they wrote this, it was not part of the Bible. They were referring to the Old Testament, to other scriptures. Well, then I have a couple more. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 37 and 38. If anyone think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, Paul says, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Boom, Paul writing a letter and he's like, actually, this is commandment of God. You see how Bible testify of itself that it's inspired and it does have final authority because this is word of God. But if anyone is ignorant, he said, let him be ignorant. One more in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 15 and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Listen carefully. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So he's putting Paul's writings on the same plane, on the same plateau with the rest of the scriptures. He said, as they perversing the rest, they, they perversing this portion as well. So Bible itself says, I am inspired. I am the word of God. Therefore, no man, no priest, no pope, should have authority over it you know i'm tongue-tied maybe there's better words maybe jerry can come up and say it you know he went to bible school right you know but the idea is this it presides over everything else if we want to solve the matter where do we go to the word of god i know even there we can disagree on things but if we are sincere if we don't seek our own, but the will of God, I bet we will agree on things. This is why you go halfway across the world and finding like-minded people. Because instead of reigning and ruling over the world and using it for its own gain, they submitting to it, saying, by scripture alone, by the word alone. So, so far, I guess we covered only one out of five. Shall we continue or... You know, how do we do? 8.15. Let's do one more. Quickly. And we'll dismiss uh, this gathering. And we'll come back and uh, look at other stuff. But the next one is in line is uh, by faith alone. We talked by scripture alone. But now, and I already made some comments about this. But... This is what we need to understand. In the course of time, when Bible was not available to common men, some strange doctrines came into existence. You know, doctrine of pregatory or infallibility of the Pope's word, you know, uh, of uh, works. Uh, then what was the word? Indulgences. You know, you can, uh, uh, whenever the coin ring, the soul spring, they were saying, you know, they would come with offering, but it's still happening, guys. You know, I'm talking to my Orthodox friends. We go to Kyrgyzstan, and they're bringing dead bones of one of the saints. And the whole, like, Orthodox world in awe. I'm like, guys, this is fundraising. They're ripping you off, you know. They go there and just to touch the box and to get that blessing. And because atmosphere is charged, you know, some kind of psychotic thing, they think this is the power of God. But in reality, it's rip off. But it's not a new thing. You know, it has been around for quite some time. People would go. They need to um, raise funds to build Basilica of St. Peter or something. You know, and they go with the box and they collect the money. And like, 
you know what? You know, your husband was drunk or not, you, you know, for example, you know, he died in mining accident, but you can purchase his soul for a certain amount of money, you know, and of course, ignorant people like, well, you know, this is church, this is Pope, this is the teaching, you know, and it was bad, guys. And in some cases, like Pope could dismiss this. And Martin Luther challenged that. He said, if he does have such power, why wouldn't he do it out of goodness of his heart? You know, Jesus did it. You know, why to charge money for it? Not everyone does have money. And taking money from the poor, even adding to their sorrows. Why he can't do it out of goodness of his heart? Oh, lots of people hated that guy. Because this is the source of your income, of your good living. We need to understand lots of corrupt people, uh, you know, it, on the top it was corrupt throughout. I'm sure there was sincere people here and there. Uh, let me tell you this. Jesus said, I, in this rock I will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So in every generation there was sincere remnant of the followers of Jesus Christ. But as institution, church was corrupted. You know, and he challenged this belief saying, you know, by faith alone. You read Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, right? You know, Paul write how uh, Jewish people, and there is the law. They have law. There are co covenants. They have covenants. They have prophets. Prophets are theirs. Patriarchs are theirs. Like, but Gentiles, they don't have law, they don't have covenants, they, you know, they don't have any of this. But Paul said, look, these guys have no boast. Because justification comes not through the works of the law, but through faith. Can we pull out Romans chapter 3 toward the end of the chapter? Romans chapter 3 toward the end of the chapter somewhere. Twenty-seven. Mike says, Oh, yes. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. And next verse, please. Therefore, we can include that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. I mean, guys, again, even in our generation, we have people who struggle with this truth. Actually, you know, the way we were brought up, it was not too much of doctrinal things. It was more about holy living, which we should, guys, but holy living should proceed from new birth. Holy living does not guarantee new birth. You understand what I'm saying? You know, you get born first, you become a new creation to bear new fruit. But it's like, man, I need to bear a good fruit to become born. It doesn't happen that way. But at the same time, look, uh, because some of us, you know, I'm not going to point my finger at anybody here, but, you know, everything you did is church, like my relatives. You know, they never left the church. They went to all of the youth meetings, church meetings, and, you know, just like great record, no blemish. But no one can brag and say, I earned my way into the heaven. You know, uh, because you can't be good enough to earn salvation. You just can't. You know, some of us, like me, and I thought, I thought there was two categories of people, you know, like, uh, you know, some of my relatives who were all their life in the church, never did anything bad, and, you know, and like me, bad guy, you know, I actually went into the world, did some terrible stuff, you know, sinned, you know, then came to Jesus. But then I discovered this third group of people. These guys are like, what's the word? Wretched? <laughs> you know, or wretch? Amazing grace, how sweet that saved the rich. You know, this guy's like, they, they invent evil. You know, they're not just like doing evil, but I think evil itself, like, oh, man, look what they do, you know. 
I'm not saying, oh, well, now I'm a good guy all of a sudden. What I'm saying, you can't get too far enough that Christ cannot save you. But at the same time, you can't be good enough that this works of yours can gain your salvation. It's all by faith into Jesus Christ. It's thief on the cross and Nicodemus. It's uh, Josephus or Joseph or Arimathea and tax collector Levi. And these guys like come from different walks of life, but they have one thing in common. They believed and their faith counted to them as righteousness. See, again, for some of us, it would be like, well, we've heard that more than once. We understand. But think of these people back in the day. You know, it's all about penance. It's all about doing things. It's all about it's punishing yourself, crawling on your knees to the crucifix, uh, reading prayers so many times a day, throwing coin into the... And, it's, and you're never sure. This is what Muslim is doing right now. You're never sure. You, you know, and then comes this guy and like, hey, I've read the Bible. And it's been there all this time. By faith alone. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 7 and 8. This one every one of you should know by heart. We refer to this one often. Or probably 8 and 9. 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Can somebody say amen? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. In verse 10, maybe, for full measure. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, where good works proceeding from, you become new creation, and then... Good works come as, as a testimony that you've been bor born again. Um, uh, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God actually beforehand prepared good works that you should walk in. So hallelujah. But uh, I'm going to stop here. So, uh, you know, remember and be grateful for. I guess next Wednesday we'll be talking about some other stuff. We'll talk about. Uh, negative stuff that came with reformation later on. Jerry will teach on that. Yeah, uh, but uh, I think we have enough for today. So let us stand up. We'll pray.